Thank so, you for your patience. Hello, everyone. This is your daily dose of refrigerants today. <laughs> so my partner, Marcela Castaño, and myself, Omar Baltoano, we appreciate that you are all here attending our presentation, so we're very thankful. Thank you, everybody. Um, so first, I would like to let you know where I'm from, because probably you are asking yourself, where is this guy from? So I moved from Nicaragua uh, almost four years ago. Uh, Nicaragua is located here, Central America. You know, some people sometimes get confused because I know that, you know, United States is called also America, but uh, it's still, you know, the continent is called America too. So Central America is just here in the tropical weather. Uh, <clears throat> my country is very small. It's just three quarters of the side of Florida. Can you imagine that? But with, you know, this very small country, we have a very, uh, very diverse scenarios that you can find. Um, big changes, probably you drive one hour and you can find a volcano. Actually, to this volcano, you, you can go all the way to the crater. Just in a, There is a road where you can see the lava. And it's really a, a spectacular. Uh, with the binoculars, you can see that the lava is not just static. It moves like an ocean. You just can hear the roar of the volcano. Um, and, and also, um, this is our most iconic food, the nakatamal. Uh, sorry, Mauro, but this is the mother and father of all tamales. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it's very ecological because you can see the banana leaves. So the banana leaves, it, they work as a package and also as a place, so you don't have to worry about a dish, you know. And I have seen people eating just with the hand as well. So also we have wonderful beaches in the Pacific. We have good fishing. And we have, you know, the diverse scenarios. So I have been working uh, for FSU two years. And um, basically I am in charge of, you know, you know, enforce all the regulation of EPA regarding refrigerant events, you know, to be in compliance with EPA. Um, also, I am part of a team that is just loading all the information of the HBAC, all the HBAC information to assist, and there is called AIM. Uh, it's, it's really a tool that is very valuable. And, and I just keep records of all the refrigerant events that happens on campus. Um, our poet, Ruben Darío, great poet, once said, um, once he said, if the homeland is small, one dream is large. So it supplies what I think about. So now Marcela will introduce Thank you. herself. All right, so my official title is a maintenance engineer at uh, Florida State University. So my key responsibilities in this role is data analysis, mainly through Excel and Python, capital planning, which we'll discuss a little later in the presentation, and equipment and service contracts, where I type up either partially or fully the specifications for us procuring equipment or services. I also help uh, committees make uh, data-informed decisions on vendor selection. Now, with that being said, I don't know if there's any vendors over here, but I don't have the decision-making power of getting you <laughs> through the front door, okay? All right. Um, I was, I'm originally from Colombia, and I was raised in Panama. You can see both flags in there kind of thing. I don't have any pictures of our, you know, traditional foods, but there is a great Brazilian restaurant around here, so you guys can go over there, okay? All right, what are we going to talk about today? So uh, Omar will give you an introduction to the world of refrigerants. It's going to be detailed, so I hope you guys are ready for that. We're going to get into the FSU refrigerant uh, management program, you know, how we do things at FSU. And then I'll jump back in and talk to you about the capital plan and our replacement plan for refrigerant units in the next couple of years. With that, uh, we're going to close up with some uh, successes of, of the program at FSU, and we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Okay. Learning objective. What are we hoping to accomplish with today's presentation? Awareness. 
Uh, this is the main thing. We want you guys to leave this room with an, uh, a goal, uh, a game plan, or at least an idea of how to minimize the impact of um, uh, the environmental impact of refrigerants. Okay. So now um, I would like to to uh, let you know what is the role of the, refri of the ref a refrigerant in a refri refrigeration cycle. So uh, I will try to explain this. This is a very basic diagram of a refrigeration cycle. But uh, the main elements in the refrigeration cycle are the piping. Usually we, we have the low pressure piping, which is also called the suction line. We have the high pressure, which is in red, the high pressure piping. Uh, and we have uh, the compressor is one of the main components. We have the condenser, which is, is all, always outside because it's the one that is rejecting the heat to the environment. And we have the evaporator or the air handler that is, that is located inside the building or the room that we want to, to cool. So basically, the cycle starts when you put electricity, what you turn on the compressor, you know, um, the refrigerant, uh, the compressor starts compressing the refrigerant and pushes through the coils of the condenser. Then it gets really hot, and um, so you have to condense it uh, and so there is a fan, you know, in the, in the condensing unit that force or pushes air and throw all that heat all the way to the environment. Um, then, you know, the refrigerant reaches the metering device. And is in that element is where actually the magic of refrigeration happens. There is an ab abruptly... Uh, a change in the pressure. It's like a huge expansion over there. Uh, so the refrigerant now is ready to absorb heat. Uh, this is something similar to when you rub alcohol in your skin and you push, uh, you know, you know, you blow, you feel cool. So it's because the alcohol is evaporating and taking all the heat from your skin. It's the same concept. So the refrigerant absorb all the heat through the evaporator and become gas again. And also in the evaporator, you know, you have fans that pushes the air and absorb all the heat, all the, all the surrounding area. And then the refrigerant is just gas because it receives all the heat and is suctioned by the compression and start a cycle again. So it's, it's, a, it's a cycle that never ends. And as you can see, it's a very, the refrigerant is just inside the pipes. So it never got into the environment, you know? It's supposed to be 100% hermetically. So uh, the problem starts when there is a leak. Leaks could happen because of fractures in pipes, because um, corrosion can perforate a coil, can perforate the evaporator or, or the condenser. Um, Vibration in the condensing unit can, you know, uh, make cracks in the piping or, or some elements. Or also, um, you know, it could be an accident that runs into a piping and, you know, crash it. Uh, so when, when there are two very uh, bad harmful effects that has been happening since the refrigeration industry started. Um, but this is the first one is called the stratospheric ozone depletion. In the 70s, in the 1970s, the scientists noticed that the chlorine that was included into the formula of the refrigerant was the responsible for causing this effect. Uh, you know, as you can see, the, a single chlorine molecule, molecule can be 120 years in the stratosphere and destroy more than 100,000 molecules of ozone. So as you know, the ozone layer that is about the stratosphere 
is like a natural filter. It filters all the UV rays. So if the UV rays are not filtered, what happens is that um, there is more um, occurrence of a skin cancer in person, cataracts, and also um, some marine creatures like plankton and coral reef die. So it's really important to have that, you know, that uh, filter, natural filter. So another effect that, harmful effect that can happen is, is also known as a global warming potential. It's a different thing. This is like an insulation that is created above the globe. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an insulation that does, doesn't allow the heat to come out to, uh, um, to another layer of the atmosphere. So the infrared ray of the sun can penetrate this barrier and, and heat and warm the ground level, but you know the temperature, the, the, the heat cannot go outside. So the temperature are rising. Uh, also, it's, it's called greenhouse effect. So this is really bad because you know creates a lot of atmospheric atmospheric disturbances as well. So as I told you before, first in the 1800s, uh, refrigerants started like a very very small scale, just in use uh, in laboratory things like that, uh, and their uh, the tendency was to use natural, natural uh, gases or refrigerants, uh, like butane, methane, CO2, things like that, that are very natural and they don't mess with the environment. But after the Second World War, in the 1940s, the thing is that, uh, uh, you know, refrigeration industry start to grow. So what happened is that uh, scientists invented the CFCs. So they, um, in the formula of CFCs contains a lot of chlorine, and that's the one responsible for the, for the ozone depletion. So 20 years later, they found out that the ozone you know, depletion was happening, so they tried to fix and, and get, um, and you know, take uh, the chlorine out of the formula and put more hydrogen into the formula. So, during these uh, 20 years, we were using those types of, of refrigerants. But the thing is that uh, still the warming, you know, uh, they uh, fixed the ozone depletion, but still the, the global warming potential was being an issue. So they came with another uh, type of refrigerant trying to, to improve it. So in the last 20 years, we have been using mostly HFCs. Um, and the, now the tendency is try to improve and, and, and try to get us down the factor of the global warming because it's still a, a huge issue. And uh, so the tendency is the industry is going to naturals again, but in very like a small appliances like refrigeration and cars and going to this uh, type of refrigerant uh, that contains hydrogen, fluorine, and, and, and oxygen, and, and car carbons. Um, so um, this, these are called hydrofluoroolefin. This is the new generation. And also, this type of refrigerant is used mostly in chillers that are the appliances that uses, you know, the big quantity of refrigerant. So in this chart, the idea is that you can see how the refrigerant has evolved. Uh, first, uh, you have in gray um, the what is called class one refrigerants. The second is uh, kind of yellow, uh, is this class two. Then the third generation of refrigerant, and then the last generation. You can see that there were some like R12 that were totally uh, causing green effect gases. For example, uh, air 12 was 11,000 times causing more damage than the CO2. So imagine just one pound of that refrigerant was the 
equivalent of 11,000 pounds of CO2. Um, as you can see in, on campus, we had uh, this one in the second generation of refrigerant. We have a lot of chillers that use that. But, uh, you know, uh, as you can see, it's not that bad, you know, because it only has like 76 in the index of global warming potential and the ozone depletion. So I think that's that was the best of this type of refrigerant. The only thing is, uh, you can see the ESHRE classification is toxic. So the idea is always, you know, in the future migrate to to these ones that are, that are you know, as you can see. Uh, I, I will explain that in the next slide. So the ESHRE classification has two types of classification. First, according to toxicity, uh, they are classified from A to B. So A, low toxicity, B, higher toxicity. And inflammability, they are classified as, as from 1, 2L, 2, and 3. So one, low flammability or no flammability, and three, high flammability or probably, you know, in high concentration, explosive. So um, one thing that I wanted to mention here also is, uh, even though there are refrigerant, it's not toxic. Uh, if there is a big leak and you are inside a room, uh, the refrigerant can display the oxygen and the air, so you can get suffocated. So. If you feel there is a leak over here, you better go out of the building, no matter what. Um, in, the, in the new generation of um, HFOs, um, you can see we uh, have four chillers actually in, on campus in Tallahassee. You can see the date of manufacture, 2018. Um, this chiller in particular uses this one, refrigerant, you know, the 1233CD, and this, this Chiller itself contains uh, almost 3,300 3, pounds of refrigerants. As you can see, the, the ozone depletion and global warming potential is really, really low. So this is mostly the ideal, I could say the ideal refrigerant for chillers. So as um, also uh, United States has agreed with these protocols in the past, and a lot of countries have signed, you know, um, uh, and as a result of these protocols, you can see that, for example, the R20, R, R, R22, which one was of the most used refrigerant in the last probably 30 years, um, has been phased out. So EPA allowance in 2013 was 62 million pounds of this type of refrigerant. But now, in, two, in 2020, is zero. So that means the United States is not producing, nor importing, not even a pound of that refrigerant, and the prices has going up really bad. So that you know forces uh, the industry just to not to continue uh, manufacturing equipment in this refrigerant, and also users try to retrofit change to another refrigerant uh, and, and try to you know, get rid of those old equipment. Uh, there is another, uh, the Kigali Amendment also, you know, so the idea is that in the next 30 years also, there's going to be a phase down of some HFCs, probably not, not all of them, but, um, but also there would be like options in the future just to try to avoid the use of this type of refrigerant as well. And the idea is that in the 2050, just get rid of all of them. Okay, so basically, uh, the main point that we, we try to, to work in, uh, in the ref refrigerant management at FSU, our first, which I consider is the the most important um, is to have the information at hand. So we have uh, tried to you know, load all the information of the equipment uh, because it's, to be in compliance with EPA, you have to keep at hand all the information that is required, which is manufacturer 
First type of appliance. So we have three groups in our database system, AIM. Uh, we have chillers, we have package unit, and we have DX units. And um, we upload, in that database, we upload all the information that is required by EPA, which is manufacturer, um, serial number, model, and then the attributes, type of refrigerant, the fuel charge, the date of manufacturer of the equipment, uh, the location is really important as well as part of the compliance. Uh, so also we have integrate leak detection and prevention in our preventing maintenance. Uh, so now when there is a PM, we can know if, if, the, if the equipment is, is the, having you know, a leak or the, the technician had to add refrigerant so we can have those. Um, also, you know, through the contractors, we practice the recovery, recycle, and reclaim of refrigerant. Basically, in a small appliances, it's really important that you don't throw like all refrigeration, all ACs to the you know to a uh, recycle because it's responsibility uh, first uh, of the owner to be sure that their contractors are going to recover the refrigerant. You know, it could be two pounds, but it's better to recover those refrigerants. Um, so, also, a refrigerant quality, we try, you know, the contractors use good quality of refrigerant. So, um, also, uh, when you have all the information in a database system like AIM, it's really, really easy to analyze and get reports, uh, thanks to the IT department that is my best ally, <laughs> so I can I can get that information, and, and, and they are always improving and trying to you know to to get data and report, and it's really good. So the idea is you know migrate and evolve with the industry of the refri uh, refrigerants. So this is basically the structure of our program. Um, you know, we, we, we structured this one uh, reading all the codes and regulation and, and try to comply with everything. Uh, basically, uh, they are very strict in, um, in large appliances like chillers that contain more than 50 pounds of refrigerant and also they are very strict in, in, in appliances that, are, that uses the class one and class two, the old refrigerants, that's where you know they they try to to have more control of this. But basically, as you can see in the structure, the main pillars are you know first to have the information, then to get that information, have reports and calculate the leak rates. Um, if there is there a unit is a critical leaker, we can say that uh, then uh, or too old or too inefficient then we can create a plan of retirement. And then record keeping of all the information, you know, all the events have to be record keep. Um, also, anytime that we install a new appliance, we upload or we uh, load all the information in name. And obviously, um, try to, you know, uh, all the technician has to be certified as well. and keep up of all the updating of regulations. Of Here you can see the information in game that we get. As you can see, the description, the asset type, manufacturer, model, serial, uh, where it's located. And over there you can see the type of appliance, large, uh, the full charge, almost 2,000. 400 pounds of refrigerant, type of refrigerant, the capacity, the tonnage, and so forth. So this is a, a beauty to have this information at hand. <laughs> okay, so how, did, how do the technician detect the leaks? Uh, there are several method, methods. The most basic is the similar that I use um, when you want to locate a puncture in a flat tire, you know, which is, you know, this um, this type of uh, solution, which is like a soapy water. They believe, for example, that there is a leak in a 
like in a fit or something, they just spray it, and if there is a leak, uh, the leak will bubble up. Then, uh, in, our, in the cars industry, you know, after you take your car to a shop, probably they will add, sometimes they do, uh, they add this type, uh, which is like an ultraviolet dye, and then if you have a leak, you just pass a, a lamp, violet, ultraviolet lamp, and, and uh, you can see, you can see the leak right away. Um, but the best, and I think the most used method is the electronic leak detector, which is very sensible. It's the, it's the one that, you know, most of the technician and contractor use on campus as well. So, uh, EPAs requires that the user of equipment that are that, that are for comfort cooling, which is mostly facilities and in, on campus, right? Comfort cooling. Um, the threshold or the maximum leak rate that you can have per year is 10%. Um, uh, if it is, you know, over that 10%, you have to, uh, they, they give you like a 30 day just to repair, and then you have to do a more test, which is the initial test, the, the follow-up test. And um, so in another type of industry, they, uh, so they are more strict with the comfort cooling. But in another type of industry, like commercial refrigeration, uh, for example, supermarkets or stores like that, uh, they permit uh, 20%. The threshold is, and in, in industrial process refrigeration, they, they allow 30%. So what, what does uh, leak rate means? Is, is basically uh, a, a measure that you know, tells you how fast you are losing refrigerant from that, from that appliance. So EPA has a formula, and, uh, and you, uh, basically what you do is uh, you, you, you put the, um, how much uh, refrigerant uh, the, the unit has lost in and, and the period of time, and you divided that, that, that amount of uh, refrigerant into the fuel charge, and then you multiply it by a factor that is uh, 365 divided by the number of days between you put, you added refrigerant. So, in, in, in that formula, what, what you but basically calculate is telling you how much refrigerant you will lose if that leak, you leave it for one year, for a period of one year. So, for example, you can say, okay, I just, you know, I just lost five pounds in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an equipment that has a full charge of 100, but it is happened from one day to the next one, probably, so it means that in a year you will lose, you know, like probably 100 or 200 percent of the full charge. So, that, that formula is really good, and uh, so I think it's a good way. Okay, so <clears throat> another concept that are very, you know, is important that you manage is the difference between these three terms. Recovery, recycle, and reclaim. What is recovery? Well, recovery is just remove the refrigerant from a system and store it in a container that is approved by, by EPA. It could be a container, a cylinder, which is they're, they're very speci specify, specific, I mean, specific cylinder for this, approved by EPA. So why do you have to remove the refrigerant from a system? Well, sometimes you have to replace a part. You have to replace a compressor. You have to replace coil. So you have to open that hermetic circuit. You have to open it. So first, you have to recover the refrigerant. Um, so, uh, when you recover, or, or for example, you want to dispose of appliances, so you have to recover, you know, and then recycle the appliance. So, you know, appliances that they don't work, so you have to recover the, the refrigerant. So, um, the difference with recycle is that recycle is when you when you want to do an uh, like a repair. You're, you know, you have to repair the compressor, or you have to do an overhaul of the system, whatever. And then you recover the refrigerant. Then you send it 
to a plant where they filter it and clean it and take all the impurities out of the refrigerant and you can recharge after the fixing you can recharge your equipment again and also or you can use it in another equipment but it has to be of the same owner um, and the reclaim the difference is that you're not going to use it so you send it to the uh, chemical plant and they just process it and and uh, in that process, they put it to, a, to meet the, new, the, the standard as it is new as new. So the, the standard is ADRI 700 with at the end, the M is it's just an error, sorry. Okay, so also in our facilities website, you can find nine different forms. Everyone designed it specifically for every type of event that can happen. Just as you can see, transfer of custody, initial leak verification test, follow-up, correct maintenance, so forth. That nine tip. It's really easy. Uh, the contractor just, you know, fill them up and, and send it to me. Could be digital, could be, you know, hard copy, paper, etc. Um, if you one time, in, you know, in your professional work has to buy, or in, I mean, could be personal buying to. You need to buy refrigerant. Uh, my advice, never go cheap. Just buy good brands, OK? Um, because um, from, uh, you know, when I was working as a contractor, I remember we import a very nice equipment for a walking freezer. And then we, lo uh, we couldn't find good refrigerant. We bought, um, you know, one mating, you know where. And, uh, uh, what happened is that after we recharged the, and uh, put it to work, the, the equipment wasn't working properly. So we had to get rid of all the refrigerant and then try to find the good thing. And what happened, we spent more money and we spent, you know, profit, probably confident with the customer as well, but it was just this. Okay, so, you know, something that happens to me in the past now I found this information and say, hey, I have to put this and tell it, and tell, you know, the people that is never got cheap on the fridge. Okay, so this is one of the reports that come from when you have the information in A. So this is, you know, a report that you can run it. Uh, you can integrate equipment, you can take out equipment, and you always run it, and it's, it, it will tell you the real information at once. So as you can see in this information, in chillers, we, pro, uh, we have a full charge. So we use on campus more or less 77,000 77, pounds of refrigerant of all these types that are, and we produce more or less like 41,000 uh, tonnage or tons of refrigeration or cooling capacity. Uh, the same for DS unit, package unit. So in total, we have 83,000 pounds, a little more, you know, 83,000 pounds of refrigerant being used in all the equipment that we have on campus. Um, as, you, as I told you before, our one to three, the use is 60%. And this one is just 16%. The idea is, you know, migrate to better refrigerant in the future. Uh, this are, is refrigerant the consumption that we have had in the, in the last four years, or no, three years, um, what is happening in 2022. So this is basically it's the sum of all refrigerant that sometimes you have to add because of leaks and also because, if, for example, that big one is, is, you know, is a refrigerant that was sent to reclaim because of an overhaul in a chiller. But sometimes after the reclaiming, you don't get exactly the same amount. So we had to buy our 800 pounds just to get to the full charge of that equipment. But the other thing is, you know, a small unit, DX unit that are everywhere, and, and then sometimes they had leaks, et cetera. Okay, so basically, this information I found it in by Danfoss, which is you know one of the main manufacturers of refrigeration equipment. And basically, Danfoss said that 
uh, in the few in, in this evolving industry, uh, everything is related and has to be in circle in, in, in this three important concepts, which is affordability, environment, and safety. These are basically everything has to be in circle in that. You cannot, for example, it, it, it could be very good, but if, if it's not affordable, it, it doesn't work. Or if it can be affordable, but if it, you know, damage the environment, it doesn't work. Or it can be very toxic, obviously it doesn't work as well. So, uh, this information too, as you can see, the trend is that r 4 a is going out of the picture in the, in the, in the long term. Uh, R134A also is getting out of the picture. This is the most useful in the cars industry. It's out of the picture. In the, and the new generation of uh, HFOs are going to continue for the long term. So now, Marcela, my partner, is going to talk about capital planning. Thank you. I welcome back. Uh, capital planning. So what is the capital plan? It's a plan. Okay. This is how we uh, keep track of our projects at FSU. It's a Excel-based project development tool. And it helps us track our projects. So this is a pool of just a list of, of projects that come from uh, recommendations from our vendors and also from our boots on the ground and leadership, uh, leadership things. The other thing it helps us to do is to prioritize our projects. So we have a stage gate approach where uh, a project can be promoted from an idea all the way to completion if it meets certain criteria. We can also execute on our projects. So think accountability. Basically, this is how we uh, you know, keep track of what we're doing. Um, typically, and I'll put an asterisk there because of the pandemic, we meet weekly and review all the projects. And then from there, uh, we everybody's on the same page and we know um, what are the projects that we should be focusing on. And the last thing we can do with it is to report uh, either internally or also to our up above to um, you know, metrics on what are the types of systems that require more uh, capital funding or maybe what are the buildings that are more problem, uh, that have more problems and also our performance metrics or our KPIs on how we're doing with what we set out to do. Replacement of refrigerant units. So what are the things that can make a refrigerant unit go into a capital plant? Uh, criticality. So if there's an imminent system failure and no short term fix, basically, if the unit is uh, problematic, then it has to go into the capital plant. If there's an environmental consideration, so it's a, if it's out of compliance with the EPA, uh, that will also make the project be bumped into a capital plan. And safety, if there's significant employee or student risk, we will also say this is grounds for us to do something about this unit, okay? Now there's other uh, factors in there, but this is what relates to the refrigerant units specifically. So what does our capital plan for the next five years look uh, like for uh, specifically refrigerant units? You can see that we have from 2022 or deferred to 2027. Uh, mainly for this, we're considering equipment that's past its useful life, so old equipment that mainly uses R22 and R410A uh, refrigerant. So this is phased out. We need to get rid of it. Uh, the failure incident. So on AIM, we keep track of our work tickets. That is for preventive maintenance tickets and also corrective and reactive maintenance tickets. So the ratio between how much preventive versus reactive maintenance we're doing is what determines the failure incident. So if the unit has a lot of work tickets for corrective stuff, then it's a high uh, failure uh, incidence for, for that particular unit, all the way to maybe not having any problems. It's not presenting any, any trouble. And then there's also an evaluation score, which was provided by Omar. So with his experience with the units and also dealing with the contractors, he can determine, well, this is a more or less good performing unit or not. And it's, uh, I think you did one to 10, one to 10 uh, scores. All right, um, so cost estimates. You might be wondering, how do we budget for this? So these are numbers pulled out of our facility condition assessment database, which is provided by ISIS. They do inspection reports over our campus in years past. And they also have uh, information on what it would cost to replace certain systems. So you can see here that there's like ductless systems, package units, and then based on the tonnage of them, 
uh, you can figure out more or less the, the price range for that. So we pull these numbers and uh, make estimates for our capital planning. Now, if the project is going to move forward, then we actually get a contractor to quote out uh, the equipment or the, the replacement project um, because there could be many other factors involved, like, you know, breaking down a wall or something. Okay. So uh, roughly for our uh, capital plan in the next five years, we have about 50 units that need to be replaced because they're old and use auto compliance re uh, refrigerant. And let's, you know, most of them are between five, uh, five uh, tons and 10 tons. And there's a few over, you know, between 10 and 20 tons. Uh, if we price that at an average pricing, then it's about $250,000 worth of replacement projects. Okay. Back to Omar. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so here you can see the achievement of the of the refrigerant management program. As you can see, uh, we estimate that 90% of small and medium size appliances are already you know, loaded in the database system. 100% uh, of all large appliances. Um, uh, we have developed an operation procedure manual for the refrigerant management, so it can be inherited, you know, so to new employees or new people that comes to work in that field. Uh, we have complete uh, three years of, of record keeping of, uh, so to be in compliance with EPA that, that is required to, to have record keeping of the last, at least, at least three years with refrigerants events. Um, we have integrated the leak detection and prevention to preventing maintenance. So now every time there's a PM, uh, there are some you know, uh, checkpoints that are related to uh, events of refrigerant. And, um, and also we have established a process with uh, contractors just to recover, cycle, and reclaim refrigerant on campus. Um, so in this word sensible, uh, I just wanted to, to, you know, to point some keywords and, um, and basically S from, to sun, you know, everything comes to, from sun, infrared, heat, uh, UV rays, but, um, you know, we have to keep the natural balance so the sun uh, doesn't harm doesn't harm the, the life on the earth. Environment, you know, take, take care of it and protect it. Never release refrigerant to the atmosphere. Safety, consider toxicity and flammability of refrigerants. Irreversible, avoid to get to the point that everything is irreversible, we, we cannot back. Be responsible, let's do it because we care, not because someone tells us not to do it. Leaks, address leaks as soon as possible and evolve. This industry is changing quickly and we all together have to work on that. So, um, acknowledgement, we want to thank Steve Fryman, our wonderful coach, <laughs> Mauro Mancilla, here present, and Stacy, thank you very much. And also, you know, um, say thank you to this organization, Camar Danfoss, ESCO Institute, and obviously, uh, uh, FLAP. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody. All right. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> Uh, we're selling more. The refrigerant for uh, ice machines uh, mm -hmm. on our campus, we're using 134A. We had a discussion two days ago where one of the service techs was saying that one of the refl replacements for the refrigerant, it didn't be a name or a number, but it's going to pertain to a mixture with nitrogen. No, I'm sorry, <laughs> propane. Propane. Uh huh. Yeah, uh, for new, um, th that's, that's the new generation of a small appliances. Actually, refrigerators and, and cars are coming now with, yeah, with uh, this type of natural propane and isobutane, this natural. And 
you know, the thing is that they are using in, in small appliances because there is no risk. Even if there is a leak, there is only, they use probably like a two pounds at the most or probably a, not even a pound and a half. So, yeah, it's flammable, but uh, the, the concentration that you can get in, in, in a space uh, it never go, it, it's going to go to the, to the, what is called the ignition point. Yeah, because uh, it's diluted with the, in, with the air. So that's why they are using it in very small appliances. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so thank you.